Just over a year ago, this Porsche Panamera S was listed at a used car dealership for $19,999. But a few weeks ago, I bought it as is from a bank auction with a winning bid of $5,200. And while it did run, it was very rough with a check engine light that pointed to a crankshaft camshaft correlation issue. Basically, our timing system was shot, making this Porsche a ticking time bomb. Coincidentally, there was an open recall on this car for some of its timing system bolts, and so we thought we'd take it to the dealer to see if they noticed its specific timing issues. And during this recall repair, they ended up offering nearly $10,000 worth of extra service work on a few miscellaneous parts, none which had to do with our actual problem. So I parked it up on ramps in the middle of this field here and started digging until we found shards of plastic from a shredded timing chain guide causing enough slack to put this Porsche out of time. If it was left for much longer, we would have likely had a catastrophic engine failure, but luckily we were able to overnight a new timing set from Amazon for only $230, which breathed new life into this poor man's Porsche. Now after doing a little research, it turns out the dealership charges over 30 labor hours to do this same job. They call for the engine to come out of the car and then to remove the engine from the transmission, which is totally unnecessary. But at their labor rate of $300 an hour, this is a job that would well exceed $10,000 at the dealer. And this pretty well exposes how the system is actually driven by cash flow by adding excessive unnecessary work to maximize profits. Now Porsche's actual slogan is driven by dreams and growing up I dreamed of owning a Porsche for the price of a Peugeot and luckily I've been able to live this dream out a few times over and as long as you don't mind DIYing you can too. So far, we're in this Panamera only around $5,600, but with almost 180,000 miles on the odometer, there's bound to be quite a few more issues with it. But with the engine back together and running much better, we'll be able to road test it and look over this car to find these issues and see if we can keep this cheap Porsche actually cheap, but also usable. We wanna be able to drive this thing Monday through Sunday, which is a super efficient DIY way to maintain your lawn. There's no guesswork or research necessary. Once you input your address and answer a few questions, Sunday will create you a tailor-made lawn care plan. Everything you need to get started comes along with your kit and is shipped totally free. My first delivery came with this soil test kit so Sunday can continue to improve the nutrient packets best for my yard. Each packet contains no pesticides, no harsh chemicals, and are plant-friendly, designed with safety and your family in mind. And the best part about a Sunday lawn care plan is that it will cost me a fraction of what a traditional lawn care service would charge, especially because they're running the best deal that they ever have right now with 30% off a custom lawn care plan. All you have to do is visit GetSunday.com slash SamCrack or hit the link in the description. Now, I spend a lot of time on grass and I'd much rather a soft, luscious green patch over something hard and sandy that's why i chose sunday you can too over at getsunday.com slash sam crack this was one of porsche's first cars with a dual clutch transmission so i say we start our road test with a little bit of launch control we're going to put in the sport plus we'll hold this for traction control off foot on the brake we're going to mash the gas pedal all the way down and let go whoa 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 that's not gonna be your quickest way till 60, but I think it's probably the most fun you'll have to 60. It's amazing how it just held that rev limiter until it got to speed, gripped, and then went. It's surprisingly quick for a naturally aspirated V8. In the, today's day, where we have all these twin turbo V8s that are just ridiculously fast, uh, there's something about having a little bit more character than speed, and that's what I'm feeling out of the Panamera here. For a 10 year old car, it just doesn't feel like it in here. And the materials and build quality are top notch. So everything is held up really well, even though this is a very well used car. And I love little stuff like this, this screen right here. That's something that could become very dated, very quick, but they use a nice high quality, a high res screen and it displays a lot of relevant information. How about the radio here? Think about what a radio looks like in the same exact year Bentley Continental GT, a car that was also made by Volkswagen. And then look at the one in this Panamera. It's crisp, it's nice. Everything works quickly. You press buttons and again, it just works. The Sport Chrono Clock, they haven't even changed the styling of that ever because it just looks great. And while the center stack is a little busy, at the very least you get physical buttons, which a lot of people still like, and each button serves a specific purpose. Just 
cruising around regularly, this transmission, well, it feels kind of like a normal automatic. It's very smooth. It's obviously snappy because it is a dual clutch. And I'm pretty sure this is uh, Porsche's first generation dual clutch. For it being a first generation, uh, that's really impressive because a lot of the early dual clutches that were found in like Fords and uh, Volkswagens, they were pretty clunky, generally unreliable. Who knows if this one's been replaced at 180,000 miles, but I mean, you just saw it bounce off the rev limiter and then shift like lightning. I will tell you that the, the button controls, the paddle shifters here on the steering wheel, there is a slight noticeable delay, but again, for being a first gen, I would say totally acceptable and actually excellent. The engine in this car is a V8 with 400 horsepower. When we were working on it, it reminded me a lot of an American V8, which uh, of the same era in a car like a Corvette or a Mustang, those would have had around 400 horsepower. And it has some similar driving characteristics of an American V8, a good exhaust note and that kind of low end torque. And it, it's a lot of fun. It does have that kind of Porsche flair to it and it fits this car very well. Porsche isn't really known for their V8s, but this engine does does make this car feel like a Porsche. The other thing that really makes it feel like a Porsche is the way you sit in it. Now, I'm not sure if this was supposed to be a competitor to like the midsize uh, sedans or the full size sedans from the luxury automakers. Obviously, it's a very big, very hefty car, but the seating arrangement is nothing like those cars. First of all, it's only got four seats in it, but here in the driver's seat, you sit really low, just like a 911. You got this kind of high center console here, which again makes you feel Feel like you're sitting even lower and then when you put your hand right down you're right on top of the shifter just like in a 911 so again something else about this car that is distinctively Porsche and I know I keep on calling a Porsche very Porsche like but there's a good reason for that and that's because all of these new Porsches share a lot of the same drivetrains with the Audis the current generation Panamera has a drivetrain straight out of the Audis this engine was only offered in the Panamera and the Cayenne of this era. So this was developed for this car. And as they continue to share these platforms along all the uh, makes owned by Volkswagen essentially, well, I think each car loses a bit of character. Right now I'm just kind of driving it chill along this twisty road and it's a really nice driving car, but you could tell a difference when you put it in that Sport Plus mode. It sharpens the throttle, it sharpens the way the gears shift. It also holds the revs way longer. And so for under $6,000, this is a heck of a lot of car but not all of it's perfect. I'm hearing a little bit of clunking in the suspension over uneven pavement and sometimes when I hit the brakes. We'll figure that out soon enough. Let's get this home, let's get it up on the lift and see if we can't find the source of that suspension clunk. At the same time, see how good or how bad the overall condition of this car really is. Right off the bat, I am noticing a bit of a drip here and that does not look like uh, it's coming from the air conditioner. This is definitely motor oil. Now, when I was taking the lower oil pan off here to uh, clean it out, take all those plastic shards out when we did the timing kit, I noticed it was really gunky even higher up. And I did see this. We've got a little bit of an upper oil pan leak. It looks like it's coming from the front most part of the upper oil pan. Now the upper oil pan is basically the lower most part of the engine here. And if you take a look at all the screws that hold it in place, uh, while it's quite big, it spans all the way back towards the transmission, it does look like it could be taken out of place with the engine still in. You're gonna wanna just remove this trim right here. This metal piece comes out of place and then a second person would be really handy to help you lower this down, tilt it, and bring it out towards you. The frontmost bolt here, you see how bad the leak is up there? And then it's funny, when you go off to the side, everything is super clean. I'm wondering if just those frontmost bolts are a little loose. Let's try and tighten those real quick. This is one of those jobs that they would charge you a fortune for at the dealership. I'm wondering if they call for an engine out service on this. All right, so I'm on the screw. We're gonna turn it. Oh, look at that. It is loose a little bit. Crazy, look, I'm still turning it. I've got this long quarter inch extension too, so that shows you how really loose it is. I can't believe how loose this was. 
It'll be really interesting to see how much tightening that slows our leak because it was pretty loose. And remember, this is a great value Porsche project, so uh, keeping the budget low is the name of the game, albeit it wouldn't be too expensive to fix the upper oil pan gasket because you really just use a bottle of RTV to reseal it. There is no actual gasket that you buy from Porsche for that. Uh, it's just a big labor job. So this is something that I'll monitor as I drive it over the next couple weeks. And if it stays kind of bad, we would need to get it done. But if it slowed it down considerably, you could leave it like that until it gets really bad. I think the Porsche dealer just entered the chat when I said you could leave a small oil leak. But speaking of the Porsche dealer, they recommended we swap out our motor mounts. They said that they're old and that they're worn and the engine is vibrating because of it. Now, uh, we know why the engine was really vibrating and we did do the classic motor mount test where you stick the car in drive with your foot on the brake, give it a little gas. Here's how things looked. So these motor mounts are clearly in halfway decent shape. Uh, I'd argue that they look pretty clean and you can see the top bushing there looks uh, pretty well perfect. If you look at the color of the metal compared to like what you see here on the uh, subframe, this does look to be a replaced part. I mean, just look in here, you can see dirt that's consistent with the age of the car and then you see things that are lighter in color like uh, the motor mounts here. You can see the upper part of this motor mount again in comparison to the subframe here. So these probably were replaced at one time. That was arguably the worst takeaway from the dealership is that they want almost five grand to do motor mounts. Uh, but there were a few people in the comments last time that defended the reason why uh, they need $5,000 for these is because they're extremely difficult to get out. Now, first off, I did price these out online in OE replacement set. It's about $170 each for these two. I don't know what the top one costs. It looks a lot simpler. I bet it costs well under $100. Uh, so just figure all three mounts together. Maybe you spend $500 in parts tops. Still trying to figure out why the dealer wants so much to do this job. It doesn't really look all that hard at all. On an all-wheel drive model, it's a different story. It'd be a lot tougher to work here because there'd be a front differential. But clearly we have access to the two lower bolts on the mount here. Then there's going to be a fastener directly on top of the mount here. It could be a nut, it could be a bolt, but there's plenty room on either side to put a ratchet kind of through the wheel well area here above the uh, subframe. Then with both sides loose, you're going to need to lift the engine. The shade tree way of doing this is take a real nice two by four and jack in the center of the oil pan. But if you got a lift, you could use a pole jack and you're going to push up on the wing that attaches to the mount. Either way, we've already pretty well proved that we don't need to replace these, but for those of you that were curious, Curious on how you would go about replacing them, this is how I would do it. Now, the next thing the dealer quoted uh, almost $2,500 for was a set of front brakes. And I do totally agree with them there. If you look at our pad life, it is uh, pretty well gone. There's a little tiny bit of pad there. So this car is okay to at least move around and drive a little bit, but you'd want to do the front brakes and the rotors are a little, little bit worn. If you wanted to, you could get them resurfaced, but new rotors are generally cheap, especially for old model cars. I looked the brake parts up for this and you can get a set of name brand front pads for $25. If you wanted to keep it super cheap, you could do a pad slap, however, you should hone the brake rotors a little bit. They do sell this at-home tool. I used it in another video for an Audi RS7. The big difference with that car is that it has a special rotor and they are extremely expensive. So reusing them one pad cycle, I didn't think would be that big of a deal. But for this Panamera, since it's such an old car, they have a lot of aftermarket rotors that started around $80 for the fronts. That's really cheap. So I would just go and recommend getting a whole set for about $200 in front brakes. You're still beating the dealership for over 90%. I took a look at both front corners of the suspension. Some of the parts look fresh like this uh, end link. Some of the parts look kind of old, but I don't see any busted ball joints or any bad bushings. It all just kind of looks straightforward. I will tell you that upper control arm does look brand new. It's nice and clean. The one thing I was surprised to see is a Magride damper here. I thought for sure that these would have an air suspension. I think some of them did come with an air ride suspension. I'd argue that a Magride suspension is the best type of modern suspension you can have, especially on a sports sedan, because it can really tighten up a big heavy car like this in the corners, but it can make it feel like a smooth, floaty luxury car just when you're cruising down the road. It is truly amazing, but it is one of the more expensive suspensions to maintain, generally even more expensive than these remanufactured 
manufactured air suspension components that we're seeing nowadays. So uh, that's kind of the only problem here. And since we didn't see any issues with the steering or suspension parts, at least not yet, this could be expensive. I already noticed this dust boot is hanging low. And now when Magride shocks fail, you usually see them leak, but you see them leak like around here, around the base. And you'll see kind of like oily stuff here. And I'm not seeing any on the rod. So I'm trying to look. I'm wondering if this upper mount, hold on here. See what's going on? This is the bump stop. So this shock was probably replaced at one time again because I've never seen a mag ride shock last, you know, well over 100,000 miles. And they probably just reused the old bump stops. And that's the source of our clicking and clacking. Uh, it could be that, and we could also have a bit of a worn upper mount here. Uh, I don't know if the bump stop comes as part of it. I don't think it does, but you could see part of it stuck up in there. This will definitely cause a lot of noise. They exist to basically get rid of that noise and tighten up your shock. It's funny, when I was driving, I couldn't really tell if the source of noise was coming from the passenger or the driver's side. It must have been coming from both. Look, same exact thing is going on here. Actually, there's no bump stop left here. So we've got like loose parts floating around in here. Let's check the bottom of this shock here. Yeah, so again, we got really lucky. Bump stops are probably what? 20 to 30 bucks a piece at most. And since they're so cheap, I would 100% just start with those. If the upper strut mounts are cheap as well, like under 50, 60 bucks a piece, I might want to replace those because you do have to lower the shock down at the very least. You might have to actually remove it from the car to replace those. But uh, once they're done, I'm betting all that noise goes away in the front end and it probably will just tighten up just a little bit more. It already drives pretty good. Realistically, if we're going to drive this thing around, we can't do it with a smashed out taillight lens. They sell replacement lenses, but I think it's a better idea just to buy a whole entire used taillight assembly found those around 350 to 400 bucks then getting in the interior here there's one last thing i think is wrong with this car let's see if i can recreate what i heard earlier today the car shouldn't be too warm i just moved it off the lift but if you hear what i hear this will be the most expensive repair out of everything we found so far But when it's dead cold, like you wait to start it in the morning, the crank is even longer. And that usually points to a failing high pressure fuel pump. And those can be very pricey. I looked it up for the Panamera here and remanufactured one sell for about $500. And you get OEM replacements that are north of $1,500. So by the time you get your fresh brakes and bump stops, well, you might not even be able to use them because your high pressure fuel pump will have failed. And that's just kind of the nature of these cars. There's a lot of cheap parts that you can source online because they're so old, but a few of the parts that are common failure items will be expensive and the jobs will be labor intensive. In the eyes of the dealership, this car will always be mechanically totaled, but if you're a DIYer, I think that the Panamera is a solid platform. Now I wanna hear from you guys. Do you want to see me take this Panamera all the way and make it the perfect daily driver? We'll fix every little thing on it, including the fuel pumps. Or should we just kind of use it as is, send it down the road when it's time and get to work on that Camaro ZL1? Just let me know down in the comments. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, make sure you hit that button. So whether we continue work on the Panamera or jump over to the Camaro, you're the first to find out when the video is released. Guys, I can't thank each and every one of you enough for watching today. I'll catch you very soon. Thank you.